Just a quick note, all references and citations made in this video will be attached accordingly in the description box below. I'm going to start the video with a very cliche question. Have you ever felt as if you're not enough just by a simple fiddle waddle through Instagram? Of course, everyone has, I think. But to put myself in the same shoes, I feel you. As I was scrolling YouTube, watching my own personal echo chamber on display, I noticed that some of the content is quite strong to my well-being. The more I watch these types of videos, the more I question my own being, and the more I feel the desire to become someone else. Take as an example, this elderly person right here. Do you know who he is? Well, it's okay if you don't because we're gonna be finding out by taking a look at this short by Daniel Bank. Your car is incredible, what do you do for a living? Just curious. He doesn't speak English. Oh, any industry that he works in? He is Horacio Pagani. Oh, really? Himself. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for creating this beautiful machine. <laughs> Holy sh**. Who is it? Pagani. Dude, what the? Now, if you have zero clue still on what exactly this Pagani is, these pictures you're seeing, yes, Pagani. Let's spare ourselves from imagining the liquidity this person holds because wealth is out of the question. Let us instead just observe his whole appearance and demeanor presentation. Like the slick white hair foiled neatly to the back, the suit, the firm and confident paralinguistic features, I want all of that. Not to mention, who doesn't want to be introduced with a himself? The amount of importance this person holds to the point his presence needs to be certified by a himself is just wowers. But anyways, the point is, the more I watch these people, especially social media posts where massive communities are brandishing their top-notch quality of life, the more subconsciously and indirectly I pressure myself in comparison to them. Now, this can be good, for instance, if it serves as a motivation instill for you. And at the same time, it can be very, very bad. This is almost similar to the effect of what is known as the cultivation theory, which is basically a theory proposed by a Hungarian-born American professor, George Gerbner, with the intention to examine the influence of television on viewers. Now, basically, the theory believes that the constant exposure to media content will prompt some sort of cultivation of specific values, beliefs, attitudes, as well as desires in the people. This is basically a representation of the saying, you are what you consume. It's the long-term effect the media can cause to a person. And as for me, by consuming a lot of these types of content I, th that I mentioned earlier, bit by bit, I started to cultivate my own beliefs and desires in how I should be as a person. Now, there's this one quite interesting um, article from New York Times by Erica Good that covers a very interesting study, I would say, conducted about how television alters Fiji girl's view of their own body. Now, back then, saying you've gained weight was actually a traditional compliment in Fiji, as stated by anthropologists. This is true until the arrival of televisions, because after the arrival of televisions, the girls started to feel heavier and eating disorders are on the rise. Instead of wanting to look like their mothers and aunts, Fiji's young girls instead dream of looking like the stars of Beverly Hills 90210. The girls have cultivated the desire to be similar looking to the American slender stars, just like I have cultivated beliefs to become like Horatio Pagani. But again, as I have mentioned earlier, this can be good and bad at the same time. If the Fiji girls started to lead a better, healthier lifestyle in order to adopt the slender figures of America, then it's good. But if they keep questioning the inability for them to be as good looking as those American genetics, then something might go very wrong. Now, where am I going with this? Um, a week, uh, a few weeks prior, I mean, I was attending to my counseling class as usual, and I was introduced with a notion propelled by Carl Rogers, uh, an American psychologist who is known as the person that developed person-centered therapy or PCT, 
which is a form of non-directive counselling. And some also know him as a student of Sigmund Freud, uh, which some might deem him as the father of psychology. But anyways, he stated that there are two different divisions of ourselves, which are the real self as well as the ideal self. Now, as the name suggests, the real self is the person you actually are, a person with no masked identity or any potential social behaviors. It's just simply and purely you, at home with no one bothering you in your own private solitary space. But the ideal self is the person who you want to be. <clears throat> Perhaps you aspire to be more of a family person, or you wish to be better at sports. But at the same time, let's say lack of social skills and physical restrictions restrain you from being a family person as well as an athlete. So off you go, walking down the path of your real self, developing more and more distant to your ideal self over time. Now this will result in incongruence, a term which can be defined as the great discrepancy or the gap between our real self and ideal self. This will, of course, result in unhappiness and unsatisfactory life, while congruence means that your real self and ideal self are very similar. Okay, which you can, as you can guess, uh, it leads to a better quality of life. But all in all, this means that the more your real self overlaps with your ideal self, the happier you are likely to be. That's the simple way to put it. With that being said, I, I just can't help myself but to question, is happiness really determined by relative standards? Does the circumstance and the people around me really govern the way I pursue my own kind of happiness? And let's say if I don't become someone that I aspire to be, or Bagani, will I be unhappy with my life? And there's this one example that I like to use, it's a, let's say, it's a situation of a person receiving an envelope with 30 bucks in it for free, he would most likely be happy about it, right? But what if he sees that the person beside him receives the same envelope but with 300 bucks in it? Would he still be happy, knowing that he took the short end of the stick? I mean, that depends on the person himself because technically you still get 30 bucks for free. But just to say that, why do our surroundings play a major role in not just our emotive responses, but also life development in general. Brun van Brenner's ecological systems theory views child development as a complex system of relationships, let's say, affected by five different systems, which are the microsystem, mesosystem, exosystem, macrosystem, as well as the chronosystem. Um, just a quick example, according to Evans, the child's interactions within the microsystems and also the most um, immediate environment to the child are often very personal and are crucial for fostering and supporting the child's development. Even from Eric Erikson's perspective of the eight stages of psychosocial development, it all starts all the way from the infancy stage, which is the first stage called basic trust versus mistrust. If an infant learns that the environment is safe and can be trusted, to put it simply, then they would be able to have minimal issues in trusting others in the future. But if not, they would develop doubt and mistrust. Here, we can see that parents most probably play the most major role during this stage. Again, acknowledging the external factors, developing our characters and personalities as we grow up in life, obviously. And just to put it out there, in some instances of us growing up in life, there must be a figure that we adore, you know? people that we wish to become just like them when we quote-unquote grow up. Typically speaking, this could be a father figure or even a comic hero. Nonetheless, the young version of you would have the desire to become a certain someone when they grow up. What I like to do is to put myself again in the shoes of maybe the 10-year-old me and ask, would the young me think that I'm cool? You know, would he want to become like the, the me now when he grows up? I hope so. This could be anything small and not as revolutionary as Pagani. It could be as simple as picking up a small hobby you were interested in when you were a child. As for me, what I wanted as a child is to be able to 
how do I say this? Uh, it's to be able to seek life outside my hometown because I came from quite a secluded outskirts of town. So I would like to explore more to life, let's say. And to be able to pursue education in the city has been a big goal of mine. Upon the years of doing so, obviously new challenges arise and realities of life bogged me down. But still, when you think about it, I managed to become the person or the ideal self that the child me wished to be, right? And as I grow up even older, new sets of goals will slowly introduce themselves, including, for example, the desire to become like Horashi Pagani. It's just the same as when I was young, but this time it's a bit more complex and intricate because life becomes more complicated as you shift towards adulthood, of course. There are more things to consider, more responsibilities and more risky endeavors, everything. It's just simply the natural order of things. But remember, it has always been about you since the very, very beginning. All the way from infancy up until now, it's not about Horatio Pagani or it's, it's not about the Beverly Hills actors, but it's about you shaping your own person. I think it's normal and I think it's very much fine for us to feel bogged down here and then um, while we're being swept up in life but I also think that it's very crucial and important for us to always remember that this life is about us, you know, it's about you and no one else. As the saying goes, don't compare your chapter 1 to someone else's chapter 20 because we all have our own social clocks. I believe that it's okay for us to take our time. Life should be perceived as a wonderful opportunity to make the most out of it, of course, but one step at a time. As Carl Rogers stated, the good life is a process, not a state of being, it's a direction and not a destination.